Welcome back, everyone. Um, our next presenter is a board certified behavioral neurologist. Um, Dr. Sudha Sushardri is the founding director of the Glenn Biggs Institute for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases and holds the Robert R. Barker Distinguished University Chair as Professor of Neurology, Psychiatry, and Cellular and Integrative Physiology within the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. She also holds an adjunct appointment as Professor of Neurology at Boston University School of Medicine. And as a senior investigator at the Framingham Heart Study, she leads the neurology and neurogenetic cores and serves as principal investigator of the dementia, stroke, neuroimaging, and brain banking initiatives. Dr. Sashadri leads several national and international consortia, including the neurology working group within the cohorts for heart and aging research in genomic epidemiology consortium and the NHLBI Transnomics for Precision Medicine Initiative. She's a principal investigator in the International Genomics of Alzheimer's Project, the MARC VCID, and imaging, I'm sorry, which is an NINDS initiative to identify blood and imaging markers for vascular cognitive impairment and dementia, and the Alzheimer's Disease Sequencing Project. She's been continuously funded for, by the NIH for over a decade and is currently a principal investigator on nine ROI and or UI, UOI grants that attracted over 11 million in, two, in 2018. She has over 350 publications, has mentored over 40 physicians and scientists and works to integrate clinical care and research with population and basic neuroscience education and advocacy. We're happy to have you here, Dr. Sachadri. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, long and very kind invitation, uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be here and um, partner, the partnership with the Alzheimer's Association has been a very key part of my um, last three years as I'm setting up a Institute for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases in San Antonio, just a little south of Austin, as well as particularly over the last year, as we have all had to change the way we do things, change our plans, and understand what are the consequences of this global pandemic for what we do and what we had hoped to do. I have worked with the Framingham Heart Study for the last two decades. And one of the very hopeful things was that Framingham Heart Study data showed, and this was corroborated by others, and um, you know, this information has been widely shared, that over the last three decades, at a given age, a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's seems to have gone down slightly, even though the total number of people with the disease um, was increasing because the number of older people was increasing. And then suddenly we have this devastating impact. You have a virus, you have the societal upheaval as a consequence of the virus. And it looks like you may have an upheaval within the body as a consequence of the virus. And this may have long-term effects. So we were definitely interested to study, and I want to just say that there is no conflict of interest, and to share a little picture of colleagues from all over the world when they came down before the pandemic in September 2019 uh, for a meeting. And we hope to resume that in 2022. The virus, as we all know, has basically very little. Um, it has the DNA, uh, it has the RNA within, that's the nucleic acid, and some of the vaccines we have are using a modified form of this uh, messenger RNA. And it has this spike protein, uh, which is a target uh, that um, the body fights and sometimes develops immunity by having um, antibodies or T cell mediated immunity to these proteins on the viral coat. Does this virus that devastates the lung and the body into the brain? It does seem to. We know that as many as 30% of people, if you do an MRI, have some swelling of 
this uh, olfactory bulb. And we also know that anosmia, lack of smell and lack of taste, which is very closely linked because we need to smell things to get the best taste, um, are a very frequent presenting symptom in SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so many uh, viruses are able to go through the cribriform plate, the sort of perforated bone at the top of the nose, enter the olfactory lobe. Now the olfactory bulbs are sort of very primitive parts of the brain. As you can see in smaller organisms, this is very important for searching out and finding food. And right next to that is another old and very important part of the brain, the hippocampus for memory, because knowing where your food was, was very important. So anything that affects the olfactory bulb can um, spread to involve the hippocampal regions. Uh, we know that there are about three common conditions that cause loss of smell as an early symptom, in, independent of SARS-CoV. One of them is head trauma, and the two others are two neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So the fact that this virus has transsynaptic into the olfactory bulbs is a cause of concern. And it also seems to go along the, what are called the fast axonal transport, once it enters to the next neuron in a, what's called a transsynaptic fashion. The virus particles are released and taken up by the next neuron, just as chemicals like acetylcholine are released and taken up by the next neuron to form memories. Two other ways in which the virus may be entering the brain are that the virus is in the blood. The blood vessel, the endothelial wall, has these receptors for uh, called acetylcholinesterase receptors that the virus spike protein binds to. And then it goes from the endothelium to this uh, supporting cell or astroglia. This is the blood-brain barrier or the neurovascular unit. And so it can then enter the glial cells. If the glial cells are not supporting the neurons, then this can lead to injury in the brain. So this is a transendothelial spread. Another way is that this virus is taken up by the white blood cells that are trying to get rid of the virus. And these white blood cells often do pass between the endothelial cells into the brain. These macrophages become microglia in the brain. And so the microglia can carry the virus into the brain. And this is the Trojan horse hypothesis. So in these different ways, antigen, that is the virus proteins that you saw, have been seen in the spinal fluid using special tests like RT-PCR. And the virus has been noted in brain tissue in some pathological studies among people who die, although not in others. But it doesn't have to be a direct effect of the virus to have uh, injurious effect on the brain. We know that SARS-CoV-1 did cause symptoms like encephalitis. And we know that the flu, that the pandemic that happened in 1918 had delayed effects on many people who were infected and apparently recovered that decades later, they developed a kind of illness caused post-encephalitic Parkinsonism that kind of died out as survivors of the 1918 flu pandemic died. So these are all causes for concern. Also, when we look at where these ACE2 receptors that bind to the spike protein are present, are they present in the brain? Yes, they are. They are present in neurons. They are present in microglia, in the astrocytes I spoke about and in the oligodendrocytes, which are the cells that form the myelin sheath around the neurons. They are present in many parts of the brain. They are present in areas of the motor cortex. And this could explain why people with an acute illness may have seizures, because this controls movement of parts of the body. They are present in parts of the brain that are the cingulate cortex, that is the part of the limbic lobe and causes things like apathy and mood and fatigue changes. So it may be partly explaining some of what we see as a long COVID or post-acute sequelae, um, you know, PASC syndrome. 
It affects areas like the olfactory bulb that we already talked about, that's the smell areas. It also affects the hippocampal, that's the memory areas. The substantia nigra, that is in the midbrain, and this is where the dopamine cells affected in Parkinson's reside. It also affects parts of the lower brainstem that control breathing and blood pressure and heart rate. We know that sometimes people with an acute illness of COVID might not recognize that their breathing has gone down. And this could partly be central or neural in origin. It seems to affect areas like the tractor solitaris, that's for taste, the locus ceruleus, that is the part of the brain that gives all our adrenergic stress response, the vagus that controls, calms down and does all the um, you know, digestion and other responses. So the fact that these receptors that the virus binds to are present in parts of the brain and all types of cells does raise the possibility of direct viral injury. It also suggests that if because of the virus, the body develops an autoimmune response to some of these areas where the ACE2 receptors are, there could be delayed autoimmune um, injury. We know that uh, there's some evidence from pathology that both the neurons itself as well as uh, the su supporting glial cells are affected. As I already suggested, the virus goes through the blood-brain barrier and there is a suggestion that the blood has changes in it. It becomes more coagulable, that it could injure the endothelial cells. And because of problems with the heart and lungs, there can be decreases in oxygen supply to the brain that may result in small areas of infarction that could then cause problems. When the blood-brain barrier gets injured, little some blood cells can enter the brain, and this can be seen as small bleeds. But these blood cells carry iron, and iron itself, when deposited in the brain, can be toxic. It can be toxic to the mitochondria that we need to produce energy as well. So another receptor that the brain has that seems to be a receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 virus is something called neuropilin-1. What does neuropilin-1 normally do? Like ACE receptor normally is part of the blood pressure, angiotensin, renin pathway. This is a receptor for something called VEGF that is important for maintaining the blood supply that seems to have some, it can have too much VEGF can be bad and too little can be bad. And this neuropilin receptor um, seems to be one way. These brown things, I apologize, these brown things are um, the virus spike protein. And these purple areas are the neuropilin 1 receptor. And as you can see in a COVID patient, this virus goes in deep. Um, again, this is fluorescent virus. Uh, perhaps binding to neuropilin-1. And neuropilin-1 has previously been shown to have some role in Alzheimer-related processes like amyloid clearance and like cholesterol um, metabolism. Now, I talked about the iron, and the iron can cause oxygen species generation, and this can result in cellular senescence, aging of both neurons and astrocytes, as well as in mitochondrial dysfunction and in a pro-inflammation. We sometimes people with COVID have what's called a cytokine storm. That seems to mostly affect the lungs, but there seem to be some inflammatory response in the brain as well. So acutely, somebody can have loss of smell, headaches, strokes and seizures. They can have an encephalitis-like picture that is inflammation and coma. And they can have demyelination where parts of the brain, the uh, impulses are not going through. And so they can end up with um, weakness or uh, ataxia. So these are just quickly, this person has some areas of the brain that look inflamed, that these white areas, um, that's uh, encephalitis. This person, this is just showing different ways in which people were unconscious and recovered. And as they recovered, they're confused 
and may could have long-term memory problems because here the hippocampus is involved. Here the hippocampus is not, but the two parts of the brain are connected by the corpus callosum and that's involved. Here there's sort of diffuse involvement, demyelination of many parts of the white matter. And here you see parts of the white matter that are important in balance and coordination, connecting the cerebellum with the rest of the body. And this person can have confusion and then long-term unsteadiness and ataxia. I mentioned that there's injury to the blood vessels and this causes little hemorrhages. And sometimes they can be hundreds of these little hemorrhages seen with special MRI sequences like GRE um, and SWI. And sometimes they can be uh, different types of encephalitis actually can cause this involvement of the thalamus where it's a sort of locked in syndrome in a way the person is abulic, not very responsive, uh, but could occasionally um, be more there than one recognizes. Um, you can also have it affecting parts of the spinal cord causing weakness or affecting parts of the optic nerve causing blindness. You can have seizures of almost any type, as we said, can affect the motor cortex, but also other parts of the brain. What about stroke? Now, stroke is not an uncommon thing. So it was somewhat controversial whether COVID causes stroke, but it does seem to have a slightly higher prevalence among people who have COVID. And this could be for many reasons. We already talked about it blocking vessels or causing hemorrhage, but also it can affect the heart. And so it can cause cardioembolic stroke. The larger vessels can get blocked. There can be blockage of the veins that are draining. Um, and so among people with COVID-19, who's most likely to get a stroke? The same as people who get a stroke generally, people with diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. But also if you have more severe infection, that seems to suggest hypercoagulability. And that's why um, there is a tendency to give anticoagulants to prevent these clots to the lungs as well as to the brain. Uh, but if you look at strokes in people with COVID versus strokes in people without COVID, in the setting of COVID, younger people are getting it, they're getting larger strokes, and so ending up with more severe deficits and debt. And, you know, there was this controversy about um, AstraZeneca vaccine. It's not completely settled. It does seem to be safe. Um, very few people might be perhaps more susceptible because of an autoantibody, but that paper has not yet been peer reviewed. So clearly the benefits greatly outweigh the risks, but this is something that continues to be studied. In pathology, you find that each of these rows is like one person. And you find that these purple are people who had either viral RNA or viral proteins. And that's about 50% of the people overall. But what you find in almost everybody is a lot of immune response. So if you look at immune antigens like CD8 and CD68, uh, you find these microglial nodules, um, as well as injury to the blood vessels. So mostly I've now been talking about what happens in during an illness, during an admission, and then for the few months after that. We don't know what happens after one year, but there is enough reason to be concerned. One of the important questions, we find that as many as 20% of people or even 30% of people have persistent symptoms beyond 30 days, which is the definition of post-acute sequelae of COVID. But a third of them have persistent symptoms beyond three months. And we don't know whether this will alter the frequency of chronic neuropsychiatric sequelae. So we need to study this question by looking at the acute picture, which we can learn from the electronic health records. If people were enrolled in a drug trial, they may have 
stored samples of blood, spinal fluid, uh, they may have MRI. And in those where this information is not available, we can at least ask questions at frequent intervals. This is being done both with phone questions as well as in a few studies um, with Alexa-based daily questionnaires or digitally-based data collection. Another reason to suspect is some data suggesting that the same genes that increase the risk of Alzheimer's might also increase susceptibility to COVID. In the UK Biobank, which is a very large data set, it seemed like having APOE4 doubled your risk of developing, uh, of testing positive. And if you tested positive, your risk of dying was also four times higher. But the question is, of course, that people with dementia are older, they are more likely to have other disease, they have more difficulty with mask and sanitation guidelines, they may be living in crowded nursing homes. So is this increased risk because people with dementia are more likely to get COVID or because people with dementia have APOE? Um, you know, overall about a fourth of us have E4 and among people with dementia, about half have E4. But we know that there is some genetic, race ethnic, perhaps part of the racial susceptibility, or most of it is derived from socioeconomic circumstances and systemic racism. But do those same factors that increase the severity of infection increase the risk of chronic neurological sequelae? That is an important question. There is some suggestion that some of the genes, this is a, a Manhattan plot suggesting what are the genes involved in susceptibility to COVID. And this is just one of the, you know, they, every few months we get some new genes. And two of these genes, one of them called OAS1, for instance, has been shown by a group at Cardiff to also alter the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Again, this is a paper that's not yet peer reviewed published. It's published in what's called Med Archives, but this is intriguing. This is a gene that's involved in immune response. And increasingly we know that immune response is important to clear amyloid from the brain. Finally, we have to remember that COVID causes an acute illness, but we have known now for 10, 15, nearly 20 years, that getting ill with any illness, even a pneumococcal pneumonia, increases the risk of cognitive impairment. These, and if this illness is severe, then the cognitive impairment tends to be severe. So the delirium that you get in an acute illness and the post-delirium deterioration in cognition, particularly in people who may be at an early or asymptomatic stage of dementia, is something that we need to separate from any effect specific to SARS-CoV-2. And one way we can do this, of course, is to compare people who had a severe acute illness with an ICU admission to people who were relatively asymptomatic and so would not have had the sepsis. So one way is to compare people with COVID and without COVID who are admitted in the same hospital at the same time. The problem though is that when hospitals were reeling with COVID, often other admissions went down. This is a global study on the impact of COVID-19 on stroke care. And you saw that as the yellow line of COVID increases, the blue line of stroke admissions goes down and the best treatment for stroke, that is whether they got IV thrombolysis also went down because the system was so stressed. And so if you compare people at this time, you might get worse outcomes in the non-COVID people than you would have at some other time. And this is a slide courtesy uh, Dr. Snyder. And you can see that we know that people with the early stages of dementia, in fact, even Medicare beneficiaries, um, only about 12% of them are overall diagnosed with dementia. But if you take people who are, um, hospitalized for COVID, as much as a third of them were people with dementia. So part of the reason for suspecting uh, long-term sequelae is that 
people with early disease may be particularly vulnerable. We don't know if it hastens progression. Some studies, basically hospital-based, have suggested that there could be a lot of psychiatric issues. And we won't know that unless we look. We find the line in blue if you look at cerebrovascular um, stroke type symptoms. These seem to increase with age, as is true of all stroke. But particularly younger people, the presenting symptom may be psychiatric, could be something like depression or PTSD or anxiety, but even more severe things like psychosis and catatonia. And some studies, my colleague, Dr. Dear Asquin is studying a population in Argentina, and some of these isolated populations, the risk seems even higher. So we need to assess age, comorbidities, direct effects, indirect effects like stress, we know that people who get COVID are more likely to have all these medical problems. And a lot of these medical problems like kidney disease and cancer can also have an effect on the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. The fact that the virus reduces the amount of physical activity, changes your diet, exposes you to indoor air pollutants and smoking. These are all things that we need to collect information on to see if it's an indirect effect. And we felt it was important to have this studied worldwide because it is a pandemic. And that way you can see if differences in socioeconomics or geographic factors, health systems, um, levels of care, as well as genetics could have a modifying effect on the neurological sequelae. And so the study design we felt was ideal was to look at some healthy populations in the same area, as well as people who had suffered COVID. And broadly, there are many things that both increase the risk of COVID as well as of Alzheimer's. There are other things that can be changed by COVID and increase the risk of Alzheimer's, as well as other things that we need to study because they modify the risk of Alzheimer's. So what are some study designs? One, um, we have in collaboration with the Alzheimer's Association, an international study. It is a consortial study where people share ideas and have different sources of funding, slightly different study designs, but work together so that the data can ultimately be pooled by having common guidelines, data collection forms, um, and one of the questionnaires is something called the World Health Organization SCAN questionnaire, which is a sort of flexible semi-structured questionnaire translated into over 100 languages. And so the advantage of that is that people can describe it in words that are important to them, and then you can map it to the more conventional DSM-5 criteria. Uh, the plan is to have cognitive assessment, which includes an Alzheimer type cognitive assessment, what's called the uniform data set or UDS3, but also some paper or tablet based relatively language um, non specific assessment. Um, and then for neurological exam, where there are neurologists, they can do it. And where there aren't, the idea is to videotape a minimal exam that can be stored later. Bank the blood either as a blood spot or as blood drawn. And most places aren't going to be able to get spinal fluid. So in the blood, we look for markers of things like glial involvement, neural injury, inflammation, vascular disease. Where it's possible, imaging with 1.5 Tesla in developing countries or three Tesla, or we're even um, hoping to do a seven Tesla substudy that's very good for small blood vessels in small amounts of iron, as well as where possible PET imaging for amyloid tau, as well as immune inflammation PET. So there are some studies that are only looking at people who are infected, uh, some that are matching with controls um, from um, different ways. I'll talk about that because we don't know. Somebody who has a mild acute illness may still have a severe late illness. And um, 
We are also, um, where possible, looking at community-based healthy controls. Right now, there's some data on the acute illness and short to medium term sequelae. The longer term sequelae is something that will emerge over the next few years. We do think it's important to look at brain structure, cognition, but also at sensory motor function, obviously smell because that's affected early, but other things like hearing and vision, contrast sensitivity, sleep, many symptomatically, many people talk about sleep disturbances, blood markers, because these may be sensitive. The early stage, the blood markers may tell you if people already had some Alzheimer process and repeat blood assessment can tell you if this has worsened over time. And the goal here is to look at risk of future dementia, Alzheimer's, and also um, other types of neurological sequelae that we know increase the risk for dementia. So the broad study designs that are happening are either infection or illness-based sampling, either from a population registry. There are uh, cities and towns or hospital systems that keep a record of everybody who gets the testing done. There is, of course, post-discharge follow-up. And in San Antonio, as in other places, we have what's called a CIVOC cohort, where everybody who's discharged is being followed up. And then there are long COVID clinics where people come in with symptoms. And this is, again, an opportunity. But in these people, one can look at how severe their COVID was and do the assessments that I already spoke about. But another opportunity is ongoing studies, like all these Alzheimer's disease centers all over the country are studying people with Alzheimer's, some with very early MCI, some with more advanced disease, some who are just at risk of Alzheimer's. There are also what are called community-based cohorts of population studies that just started studying people. The Framingham study started 70 years ago. There are other studies that started 20 or 30 years ago, and they have been studying the brain with scans and cognition. So we can see how many of these people got exposed to COVID and how does the scan or the cognitive testing after the COVID infection differ compared to people who did not get the COVID, who escaped it. And so, and finally, there's a design where in some countries you just go in and look at a cross-section of people three months after the start of the pandemic, six months after the start of the pandemic, one year. It need not be the same people, but you can see what are the prevalence of symptoms like, say, depression. So here the important thing is to find out if people were infected, how bad was their illness, and to try and have the same assessments after COVID as you did before COVID so that you can compare and see how things changed. But we are also thinking of adding on some tests to focus on those parts of the brain that we know seem to be more affected by COVID, like scanning the olfactory bulb, scanning the locus ceruleus. So with the Alzheimer Association support, there is an international consortium. This paper was published in the journal Alzheimer's and Dementia with Dr. Carrillo and Dr. Snyder and others, and my colleague, Dr. Dia Rasquin, who's leading this, and Tarun Dua from the World Health Organization. And the number of countries has grown beyond this. It's not the whole country. In some places, like there's a group in Wuhan, there's a group in Toronto. Um, and what, um, and you have it's a very open consortium. There's nothing, um, the idea, as I said, is to discuss and arrive at best practices for studying this complex and evolving situation and learn from each other. It includes, as I said, um, assessment based on the WHO scan or schedules for clinical assessment in neuropsychiatry, but also some more conventional um, screening questionnaires for depression, anxiety, PTSD. The imaging is based on the Alzheimer's imaging protocol, the ADNI-3, if the image MR is 3T and is capable of that. Otherwise, earlier versions of ADNI like ADNI-2 or ADNI-GO. Uh, but where feasible, adding about 
anywhere from three minutes for locus ceruleus to as much as half an hour for imaging large vessels, looking at blood-brain barrier and what, uh, kind of sequence called QSM for iron burden. Here I just show what locus ceruleus imaging can look like where you measure locus ceruleus volume. And there are some groups doing more sophisticated, what is called Nordy type. What are the connections of the brain? How do they get affected if there are patches of demyelination because of the virus? And uh, what is called MR spectroscopy. There are groups looking at the eye, at smelling, um, as well as hearing. Um, and for existing cohorts, the study design becomes different. It's get a blood sample. And often people are not coming in for research during acute COVID. And this has, you know, some places have opened up and then had to shut back down. And so it's often a phone questionnaire or a mail questionnaire with a mailed um, filter paper with blood spot on which you can do a lot of testing. And one such big, uh, two big efforts one with the National Institute on Aging and the NHGRI, and the data is being pooled at a place called N3C. And then another one through the National Heart, Lung and Blood and Neurological uh, Diseases and Stroke, where the data is being collected in what's called Biodata Catalyst. And just about two weeks ago, there was a big um, NIH call specifically to study um, different sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, including neurological sequelae. And so one of the responses to that was something called C4R, where um, you're studying a number of cohorts, about 14 of them that are pre-existing. There are also follow-up studies that have been submitted through this application of people who were studied acutely for about one or three months after the infection and now will be studied for a longer period of time. GCS COVID is worldwide and FOSF COVID is a UK based effort that puts together people who went into different types of clinical trials. Like in San Antonio, we were one of the plasmapheresis trials as well as the Remicade trial. And recently plasmapheresis didn't seem to improve acute outcomes but we'll still have to see whether it made any difference for long-term outcomes. And this is a big effort by the National Alzheimer's Centers where this information is being gathered. And so the, as part of this new application, we're looking at whether people had SARS-CoV-2, whether they had the post-acute symptoms, and then whether if we image the brain and how will they recover. Um, and so this is in about 54,000 people and about 8,000 will have more deep phenotyping and hopefully we'll have some answers, including for the brain. So in summary, the virus, immune response and societal reaction are all likely to impact future risk of dementia and Alzheimer's. There's no question we need to study this. How can we do it? We can study people who got the virus, got an illness and try to understand risk and protective factors for subsequently what happens to them. We can also study people who are already having their brain studied to see whether they developed COVID and how that altered the outcome. And we need to understand, desperately need to understand what is causing the symptom of PASC or long COVID, even in younger people. Although my Personal research is focused more on people over the age of 55 or 65 because of the focus on dementia and Alzheimer's. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. This has um, been incredibly interesting, especially with everything that um, is going on right now. And it's, it's very timely information and, and really brings to mind what those long-term effects are going to be. Um, there are a few questions that have come in. Um, one is a clarifying question that um, is around the predisposition to stroke. Um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that that predisposition to stroke in increases, increases the risk of COVID-related stroke that may lead to dementia. Can you um, just clarify that and talk about that a little bit? So there does seem to be, at least in a subset of people, a higher risk of stroke 
because of injury to the endothelium in the large vessels as well as the small vessels. And in some people, an increased coagulability. There are higher levels of D-dimer, fibrinogen. Um, so we know that having a stroke doubles your risk of developing dementia. There are multiple reasons for this. Some of this is just two bad things happening to you. You're losing part of the brain due to the stroke and there's pre-existing amyloid um, mediated neurodegeneration. There's also some emerging evidence that having ischemia could make it harder for the amyloid to be removed and increase the link between the amount of amyloid in the brain and the development and deposition of abnormal tau. And so having strokes could be two bad things or it could actively promote the Alzheimer process as well. And so we'll have to see. And the next question is, what are the areas for future research consideration that will help understand the long-term effects? I think I tried to give a broad overview that we need to understand the effect on brain structure, which we can do with imaging like MRI. Uh, we need to understand whether there are unique areas of the brain affected, which we can do by comprehensive cognitive testing. There is a suggestion that things like attention, executive function, maybe speed, psychomotor speed, may be particularly affected. And so um, testing is heavy on those areas. Um, and then there is a need to study blood markers as well as spinal fluid markers. Fortunately, in the last one or two years, we have a number of promising candidates that not only tell us that there may be neurodegenerative processes in the brain, but may even tell you what type of process is happening. So we have markers like neurofilament light that seem to show how much of neuronal axonal injury there is, markers like glial fibrillary acid protein or GFAP that show if astrocytes are reacting to infection with astrocytosis, markers like soluble TREM2 and YKL40 that show if there's a microglial response. And so uh, tracking these at, uh, as soon after the infection as you can, if the person was admitted, you have stored samples, and then between six to 12 months, and then again a year after that, um, is the study design that um, many of these post-COVID efforts, including our um, international partners are taking. Thank you very much. Another question that we had come in was, what are some of the delayed effects you expect will need observation in the future? We talked about persistent loss of smell or decrease of smell. That's something some people complain of. We'll need to watch for that. Um, we'll need to see whether at an individual level, as well as at a population level, is there a more rapid progression of symptoms in people who might have Alzheimer's? Um, we need to look for motor symptoms like a Parkinsonian type of picture because in previous pandemics, this has emerged later on. Uh, we need to look for autonomic dysfunction because in the post COVID setting, people sometimes complain of dizziness, have what's called postural hypotension. And if these symptoms persist, they can have quite disabling consequences. They can lead to an increased risk of heart rhythms and even sudden death. Um, and that can partly be because the heart muscle is affected, but it can also be because the autonomic uh, supply to the uh, nervous system is affected. Finally, uh, Whenever there is, I think we do need to look for late immune diseases, as well as late increased risk of seizures, which can happen with uh, things like dementia. It's a new virus, we really don't know. And so 
what we are trying to do is have a comprehensive assessment of the commonest conditions and also have a flexible approach by asking people what they are experiencing um, so that we are prepared for um, sequelae that I have not considered at this point. And another question that we had come in is if having COVID is a factor, does that, does that mean that it may lead to having a dementia at an earlier age or a younger age? Honestly, we don't know. Uh, I hope not. Um, but there are some concerning aspects, like we said, that it might have at least an acute effect, even in asymptomatic people, on certain parts of the brain. There are colleagues who have been doing serial MRI scans in the UK, and they find that some people who have apparently recovered are developing small white matter lesions at six months. Now, again, the problem here when we're talking about older people with multiple other conditions is, is this a person who would have developed it even if they hadn't got COVID? So that's why we need controls who are similar so that over time we can tell. I honestly don't have an answer. Uh, and that's why I think it's an important question to study. And how is post COVID similar and different from cognitive effects seen with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? That's a very good question. Um, we are definitely seeing post COVID uh, neurological symptoms, including brain fog, fatigue, in persons whose lung function seems adequate. Um, not saying that, so in um, COPD, you link the symptomatology to the lack of oxygen and to the buildup of carbon dioxide in the brain. So if you're able to correct those factors, the sort of slowness that you see in those people often improves. If they have advanced disease where you're not able to correct it easily, you know, you do oxygen, you do BiPAP at night, um, or if they develop secondary core pulmonale and heart problems, then they have other uh, sequelae. But there does seem to be a neurological picture in post-COVID that is seen in persons whose heart and lungs seem to be providing enough oxygen and clearance of carbon dioxide from the brain. So just as a clarifying question, so if someone experiences an increase in the carbon dioxide in their brain, um, once you correct that and decrease that level, you should see an increase an improvement in there? Typically, you do see an improvement in symptoms. So, you know, COPD is unfortunately quite common in our older population, many of whom smoked before we knew smoking was bad. And in that setting, you know, they can be very confused when they get acutely ill, develop a pneumonia, get admitted. But as the pneumonia resolves, they often come back to fairly good function. If there is a persistent dementia, we're often concerned that they may be two things happening, that this is actually exacerbating some underlying, um, you know, Alzheimer type pathology. Um, so here in post COVID, we think there could be other mechanisms like immune reaction, autoimmune reaction, because you're getting it in 35 year olds or 45 year olds who don't have COPD. I'm not saying this is not a contributing factor in some people who have persistent lung disease. People who recover from severe COVID can be in, end up with very spongy lungs that aren't doing a good job. And so if they have persistent hypoxia or hypercapnia, they, that could be contributing. But the vast majority of, say, 250 people we've seen in our long COVID clinic have normal uh, or fairly normal lung function at a level where a 75 year old with just COPD would not be symptomatic for the brain. Well, that's all the questions that we have. Thank you so much. This has been, as I said, very, very interesting and, and very timely. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to share this information with us.
And I'll um, be happy to answer any email questions. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking to this group. Wish I could be there in person. <laughs> we wish so too. Um, I will say for anyone who does have any questions that come to mind um, for any of the presentations so far, please continue to feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat box. And we're keeping track of the questions that come in and we'll be getting answers to the questions that we're not able to um, answer on, on the event today. We'll do a follow-up with you. We're gonna be taking a short break. So we're running a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, so we'll take a short break and our next presentation will begin at 1135. Thank you so much. Out of their passion, the Alzheimer's Association was born and today is the leading organization in Alzheimer's care, support, and research. For the more than 5 million Americans living with Alzheimer's and their over 16 million caregivers, the association's free 24-7 helpline and website at alz.org are often a first source of information. From support groups to online message boards, the Alzheimer's Association is available wherever and whenever help is needed. The Alzheimer's Association is the nonprofit with the highest impact in Alzheimer's research worldwide, behind only the Chinese and United States governments. The association is currently investing over $208 million in 590 best of field projects in 31 countries. These studies will uncover new methods of diagnosis and deepen our understanding of the risk factors and causes of this fatal disease. As a result of the association's vision and commitment, the scientific community is now poised to discover breakthrough methods of treatment and prevention. The Alzheimer's Association has activated a nationwide network of dedicated advocates who together with the association work at all levels of government to address the Alzheimer's crisis. Under the association's leadership and with support from champions in Congress, Alzheimer's funding has reached a historic high of $3.1 billion and policies to enhance access to critical care planning are now in place. No other organization has the reach, the knowledge, or the understanding to defeat Alzheimer's disease. But we can't do it alone. Stand with the Alzheimer's Association today to build a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia tomorrow. Join us.